Hey everybody, I am uh, talking to you today about The Violinist at the Window 1918 after Matisse by Jory Graham. So by way of some preliminary um, information, first off, this poem exhibits a lot of what I seek out in poetry often, which is, if I can if I can articulate this, um, real serious complexity. So poems that ostensibly seem to be talking about one subject and in reality they're talking about two or three subjects simultaneously, shadow subjects that bleed through the uh, ostensible primary subject, that's really interesting to me. And I find my mind thrills to that. Um, the poem also is very complex in terms of its sound, just its sonics, the language, the sounds of the language itself, themselves. I don't know what that is. The sounds of the language in the poem are endlessly fascinating to me in how Jory Graham connects the sounds of the language together with each other through repetitions of sounds and repetitions of words and phrases um, and so on that level, I'm very intrigued. And on, on another level, um, the level of formal invention, I'm equally fascinated. So Joy Graham is stupendous. I mean, she is a master of poetry. She is uh, famous in the poetry world and sometimes beyond. A uh, little bit of information about her. Oh, geez, just off the top of my head because I didn't go back to check any facts. Um she is a polyglot, so she was she was raised, I believe, I think she was born in Italy, raised in France, went to the Sorbonne in Paris, uh, moved to the United States, and has so so English is something like her third or fourth language, and. Um, and has led a very illustrious career. She taught at Harvard for a long time. I think she's retired now. Her first book was Hybrids of Plants and Ghosts, which I read very early on, and that came out in 1980. Her second book is Erosion, which was one of the first books of poetry I ever bought. Fascinating, fascinating book, wonderful book, very complicated. It never states its subject outright. So for all of us to think about this, do we gravitate towards a poetry that wants to expose its subject easily to us, a poet or a poetry that wants to refrain and make us work and work and work and work to find the subject, to bring our own meanings to it, to invent our own subjects in some ways? Erosion did that for me in some in in important ways. I first read Joy Graham in the Morrow Book of American Poetry or the Morrow Book of Younger American Poets, something like that, which was a big anthology for me. It introduced me to a lot of interesting writers, and I strongly encourage people to look for these kinds of anthologies. I heard about Joy Graham for the first time in that book, and I think Sharon Olds and um, Galway Cannell, maybe, um, Linda Gregg, um, I read Louise Glick for the first time there, and Kathy Song, Marilyn Hacker, maybe. Lots of people were in that anthology that I ended up loving and following for years and years and years. Um, Graham, then after, after Erosion, she wrote a book that garnered her you know, incredible attention in the U.S. poetry world called The End of Beauty. I loved this book. It came out when I was, just before I was in graduate school for creative writing. And um, the book is from the voices of different mythological figures, um, Demeter and Persephone and um, Orpheus and Eurydice and different Achilles different um, mythological figures, 
But also the shadow voice of Joy Graham is always there. And she was pregnant when she was writing that book. And she had, there was a doubleness that was throughout the book that was fascinating to me. And then her next book, actually, I'm starting to lose sight of the order of things. The Regions of Material Likeness. Um, she won the Pulitzer Prize for her selected poems. And she went on to write lots of other books. And this one that we're looking at, or, or the poem, The Violinist at the Window, 1918, appears in a book called Sea Change. So in recent years, she has turned to uh, big ecological questions concerning the survival of the planet. And so she wrote a book called Never. She wrote Sea Change. Um, she wrote a couple other places, I think is one. And these are all organized around the idea that um, the world as we know it may end. And um, what does a poet do with that kind of knowledge? She wrote never, and she has a note at the beginning of the book to this effect, that all of these poems were meant to be read in an eight minute time span, which is the amount of time uh, passing before another species goes um, extinct. So um, she's fascinating to me and really, really, really deep. So let's look at this poem. Um, so I'm reading it from my book, Sea Change, and I've got a couple notes that I want to talk to you about. Um, first and foremost, the, the, we don't come to a, a common knowledge of what is happening in this poem. So we have to come to our own individual interpretations. And that to me is a very interesting position to take as a poet. So the not knowing becomes very intriguing and interesting and it makes me want to go back to the poem again and again. And I have gone back to this poem again and again and I find new things every single time. I love that. But there are indicators, of course, in this poem. For one, quote, my species is ill the end of the world can be imagined. That's a pretty bald statement. You know, you would think that someone writing a, a line or actually two lines like that um, would write a poem more or less that's easily accessible about uh, endangered world. But that's not the case. So Joy Graham is fascinating to me for that reason as well that she brings sudden illumination into these, um, what's the word, into these uh, almost, uh, I mean, they're secretive poems. They're poems that don't reveal themselves very easily. But there are those lines, and so I do hang some, you know, knowledge on that kind of line when I come to Joy Graham. When... So what else is, uh, is I was going to say confusing, but that's the wrong word for me. What is um, articulated in complex ways is better to say it in poetry. What is also of interest to me in this poem is, like I said at the beginning, her use of sound in language. Um, also of interest to me is that the poem ostensibly appears as an ekphrastic poem, a poem about a three-dimensional artwork, such as a painting. I guess paintings are 3D. Um, but in reality, to me, this is a poem about music. And the music is a subject, so the violinist, and the flute, and the scored by clouds, and the melody of that. Um, there is the positioning based on the subject of music, but then there's also the idea that the sound itself is musical. And I want to look at that in some degree of um, uh, specifics throughout the poem. So 
Also of interest to me is how the poem is ostensibly about the end of World War I and the maiming and killing and incredible loss of life in World War I. But it's also about coming wars and there's World War II echoing throughout here. And there's the feeling that um, the war now also has to do with the planet and, and trying to maintain the planet's integrity and, and ability to support life. So again, she doesn't just arrive on one subject and write about that subject. She seems to be writing about a multitude of subjects simultaneously. So unlike the Rita Dove poem, which is deceptively simple, that we um, that I had you read last week, this poem is omnivorous and very dense and very difficult, super intellectually engaging to me, um, and a big, huge challenge. If I look for the meaning of a poem, I will almost I will almost always fail because poems have multiple meanings. Instead, if I look at a poem as, oh, this is one possible way to read this now, and this is another possible way to read this, and what else comes up in my mind as I read, as I take notes, as I engage with the language and circle words and make lines drawn between words that connect them and underscore and highlight, you know, as I take a great deal of responsibility in reading the poem, the payoff is large. I get all kinds of subjects. Okay, so um, so another big idea for me that I learned from my friend Ben Ratliff, who was the music critic for the New York Times and taught me a lot about music, um, is decoding, describing, and connecting. So he talks about, in his final <laughs> interview at the Times, I don't know, five years ago, that um, he would approach a song through those three ideas. He would try to decode the song, he would try to describe it, and he would try to connect the song to other pieces of art, other songs, other works that uh, that gave it a uh, coherence in time. And so I think of doing that as well. So part of my job as a reader of poetry is to decode this thing. And how I decode it is on the level of the sounds of the language. I decode the sounds of the language. Um, and then I try to describe what's happening. And it's a lot easier to write about a description of a poem than to extemporaneously talk about it. And then I try to connect it to other works. And Joy Graham herself does this in the interview that I gave you a link to. Um, she says, in relation to this poem, and in relation to the form of this poem, I am working with lines that acquire momentum as if they, that's my small puppy way, um, whining in the background as if they move down the page. So I am working with the with lines that acquire momentum as if as they move down the page, yet need to carry that momentum across the shifting distances of breath and attention. They manage the long lines, they marry the long lines of Whitman with the short lines of Williams. Two poets convinced that their extreme lines, very long, very short, were generative instruments for a music that would explore and enact the idea of the sensation of and sensation of the democratic experience. So Joy Graham is uh, um, connecting her poem to two masters of poetry in, in, in American English, Walt Whitman and William Carlos Williams. And unfortunately, I have to walk to the door while I take my computer and let my dog go out because she's really little and she has the bladder of a, I don't know, the size of a thimble. Um, so she's connecting, right, to Whitman and to William Carlos Williams, both of whom 
softer. Sit down, sweetie. Sit, stay softer. Both of whom you can, uh, and I hope do, go seek out. If you've not seen Whitman's lines, if you've not seen William Carlos Williams' lines, seek them out. And uh, they will reward you greatly because one is a 19th century um, writer who, who created very, very long lines and did a lot of experimentation, Whitman. Come on. And the other is um, kind of an opposite, very short lines that end sometimes awkwardly um, at, at, at the ends of certain words like the or a or an. Um, and so check them out, please, because they are so essential to understanding where we live in American poetry. Okay, so Jory Graham herself is connecting this poem to other poets. I didn't mean for this to go on so long, but I guess it's going to. So be it. So let's look at the specifics of this poem. Here it is again. She begins. So thin, unbent, one would say captive. Did winter ever leave? No one has climbed the hill north of town in longer than one can remember. Something hasn't been fully loaded. Life is blameless. He is a stem. And what here is cyclic, we would so need to know about now. Wow, right? Um, it's exciting to find a writer so determined to encompass without yielding an ostensible subject. Here he is again so thin. Again and thin are in off rhyme or near rhyme or slant rhyme, all synonymous uh, relationship with each other, those words. So from the beginning, this writer is giving me the sonics of language in interesting ways. Here he is again, so thin. And later on, she, in a couple lines down, stem. So I have three words that are in relation with each other in the first three lines. First three strange lines. They're very long and they seem unwieldy. Again, thin and stem. And then, so he must be at this moment I think, the violinist, but he could also be Matisse himself, the painter behind the painting. Unbent, one would say captive. So captive in the painting, but also captive in his historical time. Did winter ever leave? World War I could be seen as a long winter. And then we also have in the, in the shadow meaning of the word winter, nuclear winter, and World War II ended with the detonation of the atom bomb, or the hydrogen bomb, I should say, but the idea of nuclear winter was ever present. Um, no one has climbed the hill north of town in longer than one can remember. Such beautiful rhythm in that line. Something hasn't been fully loaded. The first military word in the poem, like a loaded rifle, a loaded gun, and World War I had a lot of new weapons of mass destruction. Life is blameless. He is a stem. And what here is cyclic. What is cyclic? Seasons are cyclic, but so is human nature. We come around, we circle back to war again and again and again. We would so need to know about now. And if there is a top to this, a summit, the highest note, so there's the first, I think, musical reference, note, a destination. Here he is now, again, standing at the window, again, window, ready to look out as if asked to by his time, ready to take up again if he must. Here where the war to end all wars has come to an end for a while, to take up whatever it is the spirit must take up 
And what is the melody of? So here he is again, begins the poem, and then the second stanza, second stanzaic looking contraption of Joy Graham's, because these aren't really stanzas the way we normally think of them. She begins that one with, here he is now. So she's using repeated language. And when we get the, um, the first lang the highest note, right? When we get the first language of music, the highest note, I connect it to what is the melody of, and then we get that, the melody of that, the sustained note of obligatory hope, note and hope are in an interesting off rhyme relation to take in like a virus before the body grows accustomed to it and it becomes natural again. Natural is one of the words she repeats in this book a lot. So what is natural? Is war natural? Is music natural? It seems not natural. It seems um, not really synthetic, but it is a created form. So it is not born of nature. It is born of the human creative potential, which is an interesting idea to think about in a class about creativity. Is creativity natural to us? Or is it something that is learned, conditioned, influenced by every pop song we ever heard, every movie we ever saw, you know? Natural again, yet breathe it in. The interlude, the lull in the killing. Notice, okay, so here's some more about sonics. So the interlude, the lull in the killing. Look at all those L sounds. And we could say it emanates from the L of natural in the line above. Natural again, yet, yes, breathe it in. The interlude, the lull in the killing. So we have the L of natural, the L in the middle of interlude. The L's, three L's in the word lull. So the word lull is made up almost entirely of L's. And then killing has two L's in the middle of it as well. And all of these L sounds are called, um, uh, oh, I just forgot the word. It's a really simple word too. Um, L-M-N-R-R, liquid sounds. Okay, so it's a liquid sound, the L sound. It's a soothing sound. But look at the words that are attached to it. Killing. Lull, lull is kind of boring. Killing is super violent. Um, natural, interlude, and interlude is a mel is a word related to the other musical words of the of the poem, such as a melody of the highest note, the sustained one note. But I'm just aware that she's really stirring the pot of these linguistic um, sounds. The heart is asked to go up. Open these heavy shutters now. And you get the feeling that the shutters have been closed throughout the entire war to save the building. The hidden or order of a belief system trickles to the fore. It insists you draw closer to the railing. Lean out. Time stands out there as if mature, blooming, big as day. Be of blooming, be of big as day, and is this not an emaciated sky? And how thin is this sensation of time? Thinness is a, is in the first line is, and is again here, um, that we find the musician is thin because perhaps people were starving during World War I, but also perhaps because artists are undernourished in many ways because we often have to um, sacrifice everything in order to do art, right? So she's got a lot of different possibilities going on, but the word thin relates to emaciated and we're told that the sky is emaciated. So even the sky could be seen as being affected by the destruction of 
World War I, and um, by extension, by the destruction caused by human beings throughout time. How thin is this sensation of time? Do you not feel it? The no in the heart. And that no in the heart has multiple meanings, right? The no of disbelief, the no of hopelessness. That no is carried down half the page to no, I cannot be reached. I cannot be duped again. So back up to the no of the heart. No, do not make me believe again. Too much has died. Do not make me open this all up again. Too much has died. Too much has died as in too many people died in World War I. But also, too much has died. All of the people, all of the Jewish people and the gypsies and the homosexuals and the... um, the vagrants and the people who were sacrificed by the Nazis in World War II, too much has died. And then also too much has died as in the species um, that are perishing at this moment as we speak and the world uh, losing land to erosion, for instance, and losing land to the sea change. Um, So there's a lot of different meanings that I'm constantly uncovering in this poem, right? Do not make me open this all up again, crouching in shadow, my head totally empty. You can see the whole sky pass through this head of mine, which brings to mind what? Who is speaking? Is Is it Matisse? But he's referred to as a he at the beginning. So it would seem to me that Jory Graham, the poet or an invented narrator close to Jory Graham would be speaking. But then here, it seems like the speaker's voice moves into the mind of the violinist. The whole sky passed through this head of mine. And then look what she does with the language. The mind, so mine leads to mind, is hatched and scored by clouds and weather. What is weather? When it's all gone, we'll buy more. A real dig at late capitalism. And also I want to to say that, to call attention to scored by as a music reference, right? So I have all these musical references happening. The highest note, the melody of, um, scored by, and soon flute music and call and response of gospel music. Scored by clouds and weather, what is weather when it's gone will buy more. Heaven can serve us in the song, is heaven can serve us is the song. And lakes full of leaping, L, 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 full, fish, F of full, F of fish, and ages that shall not end. Dew drenched, sun drenched, priceless. Leave us alone. It starts to become like a um, chorus to me. Sounds like multiple voices speaking now. Leave us alone, loose and undone. Everything and nothing slipping through. No, remember above, the no in the heart. No, I cannot be reached. I cannot be duped again. My head standing now in the opened up window. And I just want to say quickly, I cannot be reached, calls me, calls to my attention about uh, everybody's reachable 24-7 now because of cell phones, which is such a shame. We used to be able to dodge our bosses and, you know, work and do our own thing and have our own lives. when We didn't have cell phones to carry around. So it seems to be that she, it seems to me that in the center of this poem, she's also commenting on what we've made of the world in terms of technology. My head standing now in the opened up window while history starts up again. And is that flute music in the distance? Is that an answering machine? Right? Probably most of the people in this class have never seen an answering machine, I would guess. Call and response. And is that ringing in my ears? the furrows of earth, full of men and their parts, 
and blood as it sinks into loam, into the page of statistics and the streets out there, shall we really be made to lay them out again? Am I plagiarized humanity? Whom shall I now imitate to re-become before the next catastrophe? Humanity and catastrophe are brought into sonic resonance by virtue of their similarity of sound, which we also call rhyme and off-rhyme. The law of falling bodies applies, but we shall not use it. The law of lateness, L-L-L-L, even our L-loved ones don't know if we're L-living. That's a scary idea, is it not? Even our loved ones don't know if we're living. And again, they don't know if we're living because it's post-World War I and we might be dead to them. They could think that we're dead and we could be dead. And, or even our loved ones don't know if we're living as in life, in death, I mean, death in life. We pass by people all the time that seem to have a blankness in their eyes that don't seem to be alive fully. Like life has beat them down. And to me, this is one of the great virtues of poetry. It's completely a lived art. It's fully alive. And its language is alive in me and out of me. And it makes me more alive when I read it. But I pick it up again, the violin. Again, violin. It is still here in my left hand. It has been tied to me all this long time. And now I feel like she's talking about what it means to be an artist of any kind. I shall hold it, my one burden. I shall hear the difference between up and down and up. We shall bring the bow now up and down and find the note sustained, fixed. This is what hope forced upon oneself by oneself sounds like. This high note of trem this high note trembling. This is what hope forced upon oneself by oneself sounds like. Art is hope, and perhaps after the end of a war, the only hope we could have is in the sound and vision of art. That's what I get out of that. It is a good sound. It is an ugly sound. It's both. My hand is doing this. My mind cannot open. Cloud against sky. The freeing of myself from myself. The note is that. I am standing in my window. My species is ill. The end of the world can be imagined. Minutes run away like the pattering of feet in summer. Down the long hall, then out. Oh, be happy, and clouds royal. And they hide the slaughterhouse. They loft it. They loft as if this were not Perpetual exile. We go closer. The hands of the end, the hands at the end of this body, feel in their palms the great desire. Look, the instrument is raised. The desire to create. And this will be a time again in which to make. A time of uselessness. The imagined human paradise. And look at those amazing line breaks. So line breaks are the thing that, that uh, designates poetry more than anything else, right? And for all of you to think about, why am I ending the line here? What is the purpose of ending this line? What do I get out of it? Am I ending the line just because I need to end the line? Or is it with purpose in mind? And look here, look. The instrument is raised, and this will be a time again to which, in which to make a time of use, a time of use, hyphen, listness. So we get both in the same second, uselessness, uselessness. My art is useful and it's useless simultaneously. In um, the shadow of climate change, my art means almost nothing. That, that is, a, is, is what I think, but also um, at, at moments what I think, and, but also is something that runs through this book. 
that Jory Graham is, is, is querying what it is to make art in a time of climate catastrophe. That she gets that, all of that, with that line break. And then she gets lessness hyphen the imagined human. <laughs> That's so interesting. It's hard for me to articulate what it feels like to take that line in. Lessness, I'm less, I'm imagined, but imagining is more, but I'm less because I'm human, because I have a finite body, death, right? That's not mortality, but imagination is immortal, it feels like at times. There's so much that goes into this. And then the word paradise ends the poem. Paradise, period. A note of irony. So there's so much to say here, and I've talked way longer than I should have. And I'm sorry, but I find this poem really exciting. There's just so much to say. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it. And thank you for listening.